Today's video is sponsored by DeleteMe. When many people hear the name DARPA, which stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, most think of the secret military development work, the sort of place it would come up with a Terminator-style robot and then the Skynet control system that would allow it to try and take over the world. But DARPA has been responsible not only for changing the face of the military, but also bringing about technology that has changed every single one of our lives over the last 60 plus years. And one project called Igloo White would prove to be pivotal to the connected world of today and how the military works. DARPA was created in 1958 in response to the launch of Sputnik by the Soviet Union. The US government was so taken aback by the technological leap that the Soviets had made with rocket technology that a new government department, which would be affiliated to the Defense Department, was created to come up with far-fetched ideas and technologies that would be at the edge of our technological capabilities and sometimes beyond it for many years to come. The US had already been caught out by the Soviet Union with the atomic bomb, thinking that they would have the lead for many years to come, when in reality the Soviets exploded their first nuclear device just four years after the end of World War II. Although little did the US know at the time that much of their secret atomic work on the Manhattan Project had been smuggled out to the Soviet Union through a spy network. The joke in Moscow was that Stalin knew more about the American atomic bomb than President Roosevelt. This was a constant game of cat and mouse, with one side creating an advantage and the other one trying to catch up as fast as possible. The Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, the D for defense was added in 1972, then taken away in 1993, and then finally added again to become DARPA in 1996. ARPA was suggested to the US President Dwight D. Eisenhower by the President's Scientific Advisory Committee to research and develop science and technology which would be far beyond the immediate military requirements to create weapons and defense systems that might be used in 5, 10, 15 or 25 years down the line. ARPA's first directors would be Roy Johnson from General Electric and Herbert York from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory who would be his scientific assistant. Johnson and Harper were keen on space projects, but with the formation of NASA in 1958, all the space projects were transferred there. New directors came and ARPA was pivoted towards high risk, high gain and far out R&D, which was embraced by the nation's scientists and research universities. Many of the scientists and researchers would go on to run and be highly placed in ARPA had worked on the Manhattan Project and other top programs. The very brightest and cleverest people were brought on board to work on top secret programs with blue sky thinking and seemingly nothing off the table. Now, while DARPA are in the front line of information management for pieces like the state, it can sometimes feel like you're being attacked by an avalanche of unsolicited emails, calls and posts. And the chances are that you've given your data to a company online whilst buying something, signing up for some service or a newsletter, for example. But what happens to that data you give out? Many say it's for internal use only, but data that identifies individuals with multiple data points is worth money. And that's often a lure that is too tempting to resist. So it ends up in the hands of data brokers, companies that buy and sell data to anyone that wants it. Data can include emails, names, current and past addresses, age, phone numbers, occupation, passport numbers and photos, driving license information, and more. This is not just annoying, it's a breach of your privacy. And if your job is in places like the government, the military, civil services, or you have a high profile, it can be a security risk. Now you can request these companies delete the data they hold on you, but with over 750 data brokers around the world, all buying and selling personal data, where do you start? And this is where Delete Me comes in. Delete Me has been helping normal people like you and I get their personal information removed from data brokers since 2010, covering the US, UK, and Europe. Delete Me is simple to use. You just select the plan you want, fill in the online application, and Delete Me will contact the hundreds of data brokers to remove you from their lists. You receive regular privacy reports that show how much data was found, where it was found, and where it was removed from. 
you can do this for yourself or for your family. And if you use the joindeleteme.com forward slash droid link in the description below today, you'll get a 20% discount. So if you value your privacy, check them out today. The Vietnam War would prove to be pivotal for ARPA and the research that went on during that time would change the world in which we live now. ARPA would be the overall project leader and provide funding that would work with many other areas of the defense industry, leading universities and think tanks. One of those groups would be called Jason, an independent group of top scientists that would advise the US government on science and technology issues that were of a sensitive nature. In 1966, the US Defense Department were desperately seeking ways to win the Vietnam War. The Jasons were asked to study whether or not the Pentagon should use tactical nuclear weapons to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail that was funneling men, materials and weapons for the Viet Cong. That idea was eventually dismissed as far too dangerous and might bring the Soviet Union and China into a new World War III. Carpet bombing had been ineffective and weather warfare had not worked and other projects had little to no effect on stemming the flow. The problem was that although they knew roughly where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was, it was a network of paths and unmade roads and because of the tree coverage they could not easily see what was being transported and when, especially when most of it was done under the cover of darkness. So the Jasons came up with the idea of an electronic fence, a method of using thousands of sensors in a network that will be dropped from aircraft and be disguised to look like tree branches sticking out of the ground, but would have audio, thermal, electromagnetic and even chemical sensors. And these would transmit information to aircraft flying above a forest to pinpoint where people and materials were moving in real time. This information would then be relayed on to a central computer based in Thailand that will be able to build a picture of the enemy's movements and provide target information for aircraft to attack. The idea was that we would be able to remotely monitor the battlefield in near real time with less reliance on soldiers having to go out on dangerous scout missions and direct fire support where it was needed most. Although some of the army top brass had pretty low expectations of a project which came to be known as Igloo White, ARPA and the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, really needed it to work. The project was so secret that the US troops on the ground and those dropping the three foot long sensor pods from aircraft didn't know what they were. Originally McNamara thought a real fence with guards would be better, but this would then go on to become a cover story for the US. So if any information were to come out about an electronic version, they could say it was a bit of miscommunication. The size of the project was also on another scale. The cost to build it was between one and $1.7 billion, with an estimated $1 billion a year to run. That's $14 billion a year in today's money. So it really had to prove itself. The problem was they were using 1960s technology, which was nowhere near as capable as we have now. Cheap off-the-shelf devices like microphones were found to be too fragile and the batteries had little in the way of runtime or would only last a couple of weeks instead of the months that would be required out in the field. At first nickel cadmium batteries would be used but eventually the real solution to the problem came when lithium batteries were developed, something which we have come to depend upon today. Sensors were also much more primitive than now. In fact the first acoustic detectors were sonoboys already used by the Navy to detect enemy submarines, with microphones replacing the sonar detectors. To help the acoustic sensors work and detect people walking nearby, acoustic mines, tiny explosive capsules that made the sound of a firecracker when they were stepped on, were dropped in huge quantities. Metal detecting sensors could also be fooled into thinking that civilians carrying shovels might be troops carrying guns, and larger items might be trucks. By the end of the war, the Air Force claimed that 75,000 trucks had been destroyed as a result of the sensor network. But according to the CIA, there were only about 6,000 trucks in the whole of North Vietnam. Radio frequency sensors would pick up transmissions from radio backpacks and chemical sensors 
would act as people sniffers, looking for the smell of sweat and urine. The North Vietnamese eventually found some of these people sniffer sensors and worked out what they were for. They would leave buckets of urine nearby and this would trigger the sensors to indicate that there were concentrations of troops in the area or on the move nearby, which the US would then go and bomb. But of course, there was nothing in the area because it was just a setup by the Viet Cong. What ARPA was doing with Igloo White was creating the first electronic battlefield, using sensors to work out where your enemies were and keeping your own soldiers away from danger. This is something which is the absolute basis of the modern military today. But back then, it was right at the cutting edge, and sometimes that cutting edge wasn't very sharp. To get the information back from the sensors, aircraft would have to be circulating in the area 24-7 to pick up signals. This information would then be sent on to be processed by a huge computer system based in Thailand. The state-of-the-art facility called the Infiltration Surveillance Center was built at Nakorn Phnom Air Base and covered 200,000 square feet and was thought to be the largest single building in Southeast Asia at the time and filled with IBM 360 computers and IBM 2260 monitors and a civilian workforce of IBM contractors. The problem was that the sensors could not talk directly to the computer center. If a relay aircraft were not in range or not available, then there would be no signals to process. It also took time and the lag between the sensor data being picked up and someone being able to interpret it to make a decision on whether to make an attack was often too long, which frustrated the army, which was trying to make real-time decisions. So the scientists at ARPA thought about the solution and in a bold move, flipped the whole thing on its head and created a whole new way of looking at the battlefield. Instead of having lots of cheap and not very reliable sensors on the ground, with planes acting as a signal relay, why not put really good sensors on the aircraft and make them remote controlled, with the ability to loiter in the area for long periods without endangering any crews and send the data directly to the computer center. What they did in essence created the modern surveillance drone or UAV and the electronic battlefield of today. Back in 1969, General William Westmoreland, commander of the United States forces during the Vietnam War from 64 to 68, stated the following in a speech. On the battlefield of the future, enemy forces will be located, tracked and targeted almost instantaneously through the use of data links, computer-assisted intelligence evaluation and automated fire control. What DARPA did with Project Igloo White was to create the basic battlefield of the future and in the process speed up the development of technology which we all take for granted today with things like the sensors in our smartphones and the high-speed networks which link us together with the internet. This was just one area where DARPA changed the world into the 24-7, 365, always on, always watching, always listening, and always working world that we live in now. Whether you think that was for the better is for you to decide. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.